This is Maximilian Alvarez for the Real News Network and In These Times magazine, reporting from Polk County, Wisconsin, a rural farming community in the northwestern part of the state. As part of our special collaboration within these times to investigate underreported stories in rural areas in Wisconsin, we've been talking with farmers and community members here in Polk County and neighboring Burnett County about a crucial struggle here where community members are fighting to protect their air, land, water, properties, and ways of life against threats posed by big agriculture and the factory farming industry. For the past two years, residents in Polk County and Burnett County have been embroiled in a battle over Cumberland LLC and Smithfield Foods' proposed development of a concentrated animal feeding operation, or CAFO, which would house at least 26,000 hogs. A facility of that size would produce millions upon millions of gallons of liquid manure every year, to say nothing of the air pollution and all the local resources such a facility would require. Residents fear the damage it could do to the air, land, water, property values, and to the local economy. I got to sit down with Lisa Dorr, a resident of Polk County who owns and operates a hay farm for small-scale livestock, to talk about the impact this CAFO would have and about how she and others in the community are banding together to protect themselves against it. Yeah, my name is Lisa Dorr. I live in the town of Lake Town in Polk County, in Wisconsin, far northwestern Wisconsin. And uh, my husband and I are, do a commercial forage operation, uh, producing alfalfa and grass hay for small uh, protein producers here in Polk County. So uh, we make um, feed for uh, people who, grow, who produce lamb, uh, mutton, beef, and um, we actually sell to some horse people too. So we um, have a small business that we run here. And then um, two years ago, a friend of mine called me up and said, hey, Lise, some guy just tried to uh, get me to sell my land to him for you know a hog factory. And that piece of land is about 1.3 miles east of here. So uh, it wasn't hearsay, it wasn't maybe, it was, you know, like really happening. And then at the same time, um, up in Trade Lake Township, which is just adjacent to us here, maybe six miles away, um, there is a farmer who has sold out to a, a company. Uh, it's actually a Iowa company, but they, they manage hog factories in Iowa and Minnesota. So he's he has sold out to those guys, and he is trying to get permitted by the county and the state. It's actually was being driven by uh, Burnett Dairy Co-op, which is a, a group of dairy farmers um, that are looking for some more value-added activity, economic activity. So they want to create more demand for their corn and their soybeans. So they came, they hatched this plan <laughs> to try to get um, the hog factory industry to move into our area. And I don't really call them CAFOs, I call them hog factories because CAFO is such a kind of obscure word, um, but they're, they're giant industrial complexes full of tens of thousands of animals, and the, they, they never leave the building. They, they never get to go outside. Um, so yeah, it's, like, it's like Upton Sinclair's worst nightmare. Well, you know, Upton was really talking about the processors and when they butcher the meat. This is before the meat gets sent to the butcher plant. So it's um, vertically integrating the industry so that they not only own the processing plants, but they own the pigs, the the sows that are farrowing the the, the young the young wieners they call them, and um, and they own everything they own the feed they own they tell the the quote unquote farmers exactly what genetics to have you know everything is controlled by the company from top to bottom um so after after we heard about that we organized at the town level the town of lake town and so in in june of 19 we turned out over 200 people on a very beautiful warm summer night to come to the town board meeting and say what's going on we need a moratorium and so that moratorium was passed in july of 19 for our town and then um, there's about five towns around us that have done similar things 
then um, for the last year, it was took about a year and a half because of COVID. But um, we we produced a study that documents what the in, potential impact could be in our in our town of the CAFO. Um, but it, the commi- the committee was made up of pro CAFO and con CAFO people, um, and so we actually have about thirty nine or forty um, citations from industry about why it's good too. So it's a it's a a balanced study. Then at the same time, we spent about two years working at the county level, trying to get our county to pass something. Um, and actually, I ended up running for county commissioner. Um, and and we, we fielded about five different candidates to run for county commissioner. And um, I lost by 15 votes. So if I could have got eight people to vote for me instead of the other guy, then I would have had to be a county commissioner. Um, but I did not win that. But we we turned out um, hundreds of people um, for three months straight. We staged rallies um, at the county trying to get them to pass an ordinance. And um, they ended up passing an ordinance that targets uh, Jonestown and Georgetown, the town, those townships, which is where the um, Ojibwe tribes are. So that the. The, that's where they want the CAFOs to be built. But the ordinance that they passed doesn't even cover our town at all. Um, we, Our town is kind of um, independent. We don't have any zoning authority in our town. So only towns that have zoning authority are covered by this ordinance that the county passed. So it's kind of funny. Um, so what we've done now is um, we ended up... Ha- During the town election, which was April of 21, um, we ran candidates who ran as being against hog factories, and we won 57 to 43%. So that just happened in April, and so now we are trying to pull together a group of five, maybe six towns, and then we would all pass a really strong ordinance. And... uh, and that's no small feat because Wisconsin has passed a, a whole series of laws that make it very difficult to have local control. So we have to kind of thread the needle on um, on that. Yeah, and I and I want to kind of spend some time talking about that, right? Talking about that issue of local control and and kind of how this fight in particular, right, has both galvanized the community. Right. And brought people from different kind of political leanings, people of different lifestyles, what have you, together around this issue of not wanting this industrial uh, hog factory, like you said, being put here. Uh, and, and, and what that struggle has kind of showed you all about, um, you know, what authority, if any, you know, townships and counties like yours like have uh, to stop something like this. So I want to talk about that, but I guess before we get there, again, to really drill down on this for people who are watching, if we could, if we could talk first about um, what we know about a hog factory of this size, um, what goes on there, and what it would mean for this community and for you and your husband and, and the farm that you have here. Well, um, we're talking about... A, a, a very large facility filled with sows. It's a, called a farrowing facility. So the sows would produce about 200,000 babies every year. And um, those wieners uh, spend about three weeks in that farrowing factory. And then they're sent to what are called finishing plants. And the finishing plants um, feed them until they're about 250 pounds um, before they're shipped to the um, slaughterhouses and they can't really get more than 280 pounds at the most because then they they don't the machinery for slaughtering them doesn't work so that's why when covid hit they had to um euthanize a, 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 i believe the number ended up being almost a million pigs because the pr- uh, slaughterhouses had to shut down and the pigs got too big um, but actually, some of the guys around here um, went down to southern Minnesota and got trailers full of these pigs and brought them up here. 
And um, they were really funny because they'd never been outside before. They'd always been in these little cages inside. And so they kind of like stood on the trailer and they're like, well, now what do we do? And they finally got them out of the trailer and then they're like, what's this? It's dirt. Because usually they're in a cement floor factory. And so it took them like two or three days to get used to being outside. So, um, so that the, the thing is they don't, they don't want to build one farrowing plant because they, they want to, they don't want to have to ship a bunch of wieners in trailers like down to Iowa to get finished off. So what they'd really like to do is have a farrowing plant with maybe five finishing plants around it. And that's what you see in Iowa. Like in Iowa, there's like a, a finishing plant every 2,000 feet. You know, everybody and their brother has a, a finishing plant. And um, they make maybe, from what I've heard, they, these guys make maybe twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 a year uh, feeding these pigs out and getting them ready to go to slaughter. Um, the impact of it, uh, we're talking about 9 million pounds of manure um, that would be spread all over the county basically i mean uh, everywhere that he could get people to let it be spread uh and people mostly think about the manure but the air emissions are what really have a negative impact on the communities because we're talking about massive amounts of hydrogen sulfide ammonia and methane and you know people all say oh pigs stink well it isn't it isn't stink. It's chemicals. It's, you know, it's hydrogen sulfide. Uh, so it's a very, uh, different level of menace than, than a lot of the dairy operations. So, uh, what we've seen, we have a, a lot of data, um, that's starting to come in. Immediate drop of like 25%, 30% property values. If you're anywhere near the plant, you know, it, it, up to 80% if you're within a quarter mile or half mile. Of, of the of these factories that you, your property values just plummet and if you want to know the truth that's the most potent organizing tool is because these people have spent their decades working their tails off to try to build a home and and make a farm or, or a lake home or whatever it is and then some guy f comes in and says i'm gonna build a hog factory and it's gonna be great and they're like no it's not we don't want you here um so that, and the other, the other organizing tool that is, um, it really crosses party lines because you, you've got people who are really interested in the environment. You've got people really interested in property values and you've got a contingent of people who are very concerned about, um, China. And the fact that really we've been told point blank that this pork will go to the Smithfield plant. And Smithfield is owned by the, you know, Chinese Communist Party. That they they put up a 4.1 billion dollar loan in one day to buy Smithfield. They are they are basically telling us that we need to destroy our property value so that Smithfield can produce pork for China. That's been an interesting organizing thing too. Is that this whole thing about the global economy and how this you know, supposed um, enemy of the American people is, you know, all this ridiculous politicians saying stuff about China. And then at the same time, they want us to turn our, our livelihoods over to them. So th those are some of the issues that we've organized on, the environmental impact, property values, um, destroying our, our quality of life to send food to the Communist Party of China so they can... Um, enslave the Uyghur people, you know, so it's quite a constellation of issues. I would say, yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, like, it's, it's, <laughs> it's fascinating in and of itself, just like how something that on the surface, I think a lot of people who don't live in rural areas would think, oh, this, this kind of goes on all the time, right? Like, do we put this, this kind of hog farm here? Do we put it here? But you like you scratch a little underneath the surface and you start to learn about all the kind of different outside and interceding kind of forces that are involved here and all the ways that that is kind of bringing a diverse group of people in the community kind of together against this one thing and working together across their differences to figure out how to kind of like achieve your goals, right? Because I think that one of the things that you and I have been talking about throughout the day, right, is that... You know, this, this, these types of facilities, you know, they're, they're pitched as, you know, an economic boon 
to areas like these, right? When really what it would mean is, is like kind of the, the death of economic life for, for everybody here. You yourself are, as we said, you're supplying kind of hay to local protein producers in a market that has quite a few independent kind of protein producers, uh, it, which is like really special and unique. And people also get to own those farms and, and exactly. you know, build that product, you know, themselves. And so what, what sort of economic boon is Smithfield saying it's going to bring to this county when, when everyone around is looking and saying, well, it's going to hurt me, it's going to hurt you, who actually is it going to help? Well, as far as we can tell, the only person that it helps is the guy who's selling the 38 acres is going to get some amount of change for his 38 acres, probably with some sort of premium price that we'll never know. Um, that uh, is not public. We don't we don't know. But the uh, the buildings themselves are brought in kind of like a Dollar General. You know how they just bring in a Dollar General on a bunch of semi trucks and put it up. The the big hog barns <clears throat> are just brought in. Um, all the outfitting in the inside, all the metal and um, cages and everything are brought in. Um, the the workers are brought in. And one of the most irritating things that these guys say in the dairy industry, chickens hogs they say well we can't find anybody to do the work well who the heck wants to go to work and make a investor group a bunch of money shoveling manure and hauling out carcasses and throwing them in a compost pile i mean it's it's crummy jobs and people don't want them and so they end up bringing in as you'd say um what what we've seen is 75 percent of the workers are immigrant labor and that is people who are sending the money home, which is cool. I understand why they'd send their money home. That's where their people are. But they're not putting it into our economy. And the, the whole system is driven by immigrant labor. And it's one of the most difficult parts of the whole thing to even talk about. Because obviously we're, we're the descendants of immigrants, Right. Um, but our people were allowed to, after we destroyed the native habitat, we were allowed to farm. We were allowed to participate in the Homestead Act and get our land. Well, these, these immigrant people are not allowed to do anything like that. They, they, they really don't even get to go to the bar. I mean, we, we never even see them. I mean, I know people who are living within a couple miles here in their trailer houses, and I, I don't know them because they don't talk to anybody. Because they don't want to get deported, so that that issue is is really interesting in terms of the global economic system. Right, and and I just to, to I guess like hammer that point home, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I think it was just this week, workers at a Smithfield plant, I think in South Dakota, authorized a strike vote oh, I didn't at know the that. very plant where you know Smithfield became uh, was in the headlines over the past year because of the working conditions in COVID. Right. Um, you, you take that plus all of the, the the hullabaloo that we had in the media about there being a pork shortage during covid. And so you had massive speed ups. You already had people working in dangerous uh, and, and, and vile kind of conditions in these sorts of hog facilities. Add on to that a deadly pandemic. And you essentially have kind of a, a, an underclass of, of slave labor that's living in these trailers around these facilities working from morning till night and not really you know making enough or or even being given the freedom to participate in the community life like that's that's kind of what you're describing right yeah and that's what drives the whole industry it's 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 a whole industry that's it's basically a, a plantation economic model it's big capital cheap labor as opposed to the vision under the Homestead Act, the idea of it was uh, you put the big labor in and small capital. Um, you know, so it's, it's a very different model. And one of my dairy friends, I have a dairy friend who lives about a mile from here, and he explained it to me 20 years ago. How can he possibly compete with a dairy that's got 2,000 cows and they're paying $7 an hour and, you know, he's trying to run a family dairy. I mean, so they, when they say no one wants to work, 
you know, what, 800, 1,000 dairy farms a year are going out of business and they're crying the whole time. They want to work. They just don't want to work for an investor group. And that really irritates me when they say people don't want to work. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's 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 so transparent, too, because we saw this, like, before half of the adult American population here in the United States was even vaccinated, um, you saw this kind of chorus of ghouls from industry groups, from think tanks, uh, politicians who are, who are being bankrolled by these same lobbying groups. This whole ghoulish chorus rose up saying no one wants to work after the pandemic because everyone was was getting fat off, you know, the the dole, the government, you know, unemployment benefits. Um, And really what it was was a transparent and obvious attempt to discipline the working class back into subservience, right? To say, okay, you lazy pieces of shit, like, you know, go back to working in unsafe conditions for low wages. uh, And in fact, we're going to force you to do that with a number of states cutting off those unemployment benefits again before even even half the population the adult population was vaccinated it's a form of discipline right it's a form of of pushing people back into that meat grinder um that that you're talking about and it just it, it infuriates me and as we're describing like we're seeing it we're living it like it's all around this 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 country right and it's in this county and it's part of the CAFO fight and I guess I wanted to kind of bring us back to that, right? Because you yourself, along with other members of the community, have been involved in this fight. And I guess I wanted to ask, um, you know, for folks watching who are kind of just learning the nuances of this, what what this kind of struggle has shown you, like what you came to realize when, you know, people banded together and said, okay, we don't want this thing here. What can we do about it? And it's almost like that's when the the real kind of shenanigans began. Could you could you talk to us a bit about that struggle? Sure. Yeah. I I I try to base my work on personal relationships, like talking to people person to person. It's very tempting to get into the rhetoric and try to try to go off. And sometimes I do that, and I but I try not to. Um, so we've we've built um, relationships across party lines and across age groups and you know have a lot of young people um, but what we found was at particularly at the county level when we started making some progress then the big boys came in um, the farm bureau and the um, different dairy groups um, they they brought in the big guns they started writing letters to the supervisor saying that if they passed a moratorium, it would be a felony and they'd have to go to jail. And um, we, in our little town of Lake Town here, a tiny little town, we had a, a moratorium study group and the Madison boys actually sent someone to the, to come to the meeting on a, on a, on a summer night. And I'm like, what are you doing here? And she's like, Oh, I just thought I'd visit her. Her name is uh, Kim Bremer. I'm like, what are you doing here? And she's, Oh, I'm just here to see, you know, like I'm just a little suburban housewife. I thought I'd come to the meeting. And, um, so they, they, um, they're deadly serious. Yeah. It's a multi-billion dollar business. And, um, each one of these dairy CAFOs or hog CAFOs, they have a huge debt burden that they're carrying. So there's a lot of um, financing going on, um, a lot of financing to buy the equipment. You always got to be getting new, the latest update. You know, you got to buy your robots. Um, there's a huge amount of capital. So the capital, you, you'll see the capital boys come in too. So we um, we basically got our butts kicked at the county. Um, they they passed a really, really bad ordinance and showed us the door. Um, so what we're doing now is trying to work at the local level. Um, and it meant trying to get people elected, um, thinking long term. Um, and then we have some really good lawyers who think that they've figured out how to thread that needle and pass some ordinances that can um, finesse the existing state laws. Um, and what we found, what it's, we've seen in other places, we don't have any big hog CAFOs in our, in northern 
Wisconsin. Um, and if you can make it somewhat challenging, uh, maybe they'll just go away. So the, the guy is trying to build the hog CAFO in Burnett County. He was trying to build it up on Lake Superior and in uh, Bayfield County. And Bayfield County passed a good ordinance and he scurried out of there and came down here. So uh, that's what we're trying to do here is um, pass something to stop them before they come. Unfortunately, you cannot ban factory farms under Wisconsin law, but we think we can build an ordinance that will require them to do uh, the due diligence that is needed to protect our communities, and we think that'll stop them. And even just like like what you're describing there is like, Something that that I think people watching would probably assume that if you're going to build a 26,000 hog factory, that you would have to do like an an environmental impact report, right? You would have to kind of go to the town and say, here's what this is going to mean for your environment and your community. They don't have to do that, right? I mean, like in a way... The ordinances that we're talking about, I guess just to kind of flesh it out for viewers, is like you're trying to at least force the company to thoroughly prove, you know, like what sorts of environmental impacts this facility would have on this community. And I think I'm I'm still kind of blown away that they're not legally required to do that in the first place. No, they have the agricultural community has successfully exempted themselves from almost all environmental regulation and particularly the clean water act um is in some states they don't even need a permit to pollute in wisconsin they have to get a permit to pollute uh and the whole thing is based on their manure management plan uh, which they call a nutrient management plan which is flawed from the beginning the the management plans were designed to maximize corn and soybean production so they're really designed to maximize the amount of nitrogen uh, that's going on a field so you can get some nice green corn they're not designed to protect water quality so they're at a methodology level they are so deeply flawed uh it's it's kind of pitiful um and then when it comes to air pollution there is literally no regulation of air pollution at all since 2005 they've exempted themselves from all um regulation of air, uh, of their air emissions so if you're running a a plant and making car parts you have to get a permit to pollute the air but if you're dumping hydrogen sulfide and and uh, ammonia on your neighbors you don't have to get one if you're a farmer so yeah i hate to tell people but um there there really is a santa claus but there really isn't any regulation of these giant hog factories and um, they'll tell you they'll tell you differently. They'll say, "Oh, we're so he- heavily regulated, we can hardly breathe in the morning." And then when you actually look at it, it, it's it's totally the opposite. Well, and you know, one thing that we really want to highlight with you know, kind of all the the videos that we're producing for this this partnership between the Real News and in these times focused on issues in rural Wisconsin. Right, is we want people to understand the severity of struggles like these. Right? And it's not just a struggle for one community. It's not just a struggle about one CAFO. Right? Even this one CAFO that we're talking about could pollute the St. Croix River down the road. That St. Croix River pollution could then pollute the Mississippi River. Like This stuff spreads, right? Not to mention, as you said, all the other kind of environmental and economic devastation that does filter out beyond the kind of uh, uh, county borders, right? And so this is an issue that people should care about. On the surface, we should care about it because it's horrific. Beyond that, we should also care about it because it also impacts us. It impacts all of us. But And so I wanted to ask, you know, if we could also, you know, on top of looking at the kind of uh, the hard truths of the, the the stories that we're covering, we also want to kind of highlight how people are working together to fight against them, right? How people are banding together like yourself, like other members of this community. And even after you run up against all the, the, the red tape, all the ways that, that um, the state and, and corporations have essentially stripped communities' abilities to fight against things like these, how, against all those odds, you're still working to find creative ways to resist and stand up for your community, stand up for your land, stand up for the environment, 
So could we talk a little more about those ordinances that you were you were mentioning? And and I guess give viewers a bit more of a granular sense of, of how the fight is being carried on through this push for different types of ordinances. Well, um, basically, the the capital of Wisconsin is Madison. And what I tell people is the big ag boys got to Madison way ahead of us. Um, they got to Washington, D.C. even sooner. I mean, they, they've they laid this legal basis um, for about, I would say, 20 to 30 years. Um, and also the the ideology that, oh, we're, we're feeding the world. I don't know how many times you've heard we're feeding the world. Um, the world doesn't want us to feed them. You know, they, they want to produce their own food. I mean, how much more vulnerable can you be than, than to have be relying on the United States of America for your food? And we're really not feeding the world. We're really just feeding China. I mean, if you actually look at the data, some of the food goes to Mexico, some of it goes to Canada, but mostly what American agriculture produces, 70% of the beans go to, to um, China and the China's the big player. Um, so anyway, what we've had to do at the local level is put together uh, an ordinance that does, it, it basically says, okay, we're not banning factory farms, but you have to prove to us that you are not going to pollute the water, that you're going to monitor the water in your area so you can prove you're not going to mo- pollute the water, that you're going to... Pr- um, show us that you are not going to pollute the air, um, that you're going to show us that you are not going to um, spread uh, carcasses all over. So it, it basically requires them to show you the money, basically. Where, whereas at the state level, they just give people a permit to pollute. I mean, literally, that's what the Clean Water Act does. It gives them a permit to pollute. So we're at, we're telling them you have to prove that you're not going to pollute. And then the the final thing that we're that we're going to do is require them to have financial proof that if something goes wrong, that they can pay for it, not the taxpayers. And uh, you know, so basically, they need a multi million dollar financial bond. That's going to bond them to say that they're if if they end up burning, for example, many of these barns burn down. So if they burn the barn down, uh, do they have enough money to get all the dead ten thousand pigs out of there and put them in a landfill, or are they just going to walk on that? Um, so uh, the the front end, we're saying you got to pay the real costs of these applications, and on the back end, you have to prove that you can mop up after yourself. And those two things is oh, they're really pushing back on that. They do not want to have to have the financial surety bonds that, that are needed to guarantee that they won't leave us with a mess. So those are some of the details. I mean, it's it's I really appreciate you kind of laying this out. Right. You know, a big focus of, of this whole project, the Wisconsin idea that in these times began and that the real news is now collaborating with them uh, for, right, is to, you know, highlight, right, the struggles of people living in rural America, right, to get people uh, in other parts of the country to take an interest and to become as invested in these sorts of struggles as we are in others. And so I wanted to ask if, like, you know, if you had kind of a message for people outside of Polk and Burnett County, people who are watching this, you know, something that speaks to kind of like why uh, people should take interest in this story and how they can show support, not only for y'all here, but I guess for, you know, if it's happening here, it's happening in other parts of rural America, as we know. So I guess I wanted to just ask if you had kind of a final message for people watching. Yeah, I, I, um, I guess the, the, the way I look at it is it's a struggle that is going on in many places. Uh, it's an economic system that's really designed to reward investors, not labor. And the, you know, the Democrats passed NAFTA in the 70s or I guess it was the 90s, forgive me, past NAFTA in the 90s has destroyed the working class manufacturing sector. And now they're looking at 
destroying the middle class rural economy. You know, we're the next target. And um, in terms of what people can do, I mean, honestly, being aware of where your food comes from. I mean, when you go to the store uh, and buy some pork, it shouldn't be from Smithfield. But that's a big lift to ask people. What I think is becoming politically active and supporting candidates that actually understand rural um, actually understand rural issues, and uh, we there's a fair amount of uh, room for improvement on that. Let's put it that putting that politely. Um, that when you're looking at the list of issues, um, what is more important than the food that we produce? Right. I mean, right now we're looking at the Imperial Valley in California running out of water. The, the 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 fruit basket, the nut basket, and the vegetable basket of the North American continent is running out of water. So that the the issue really to bring to the fore politically is um, how are we producing our food and who's who's benefiting. When you hear uh, President Biden talk about oh we gotta we gotta improve the uh, export agricultural exports, think about pigs being sent to Sioux Falls, South Dakota, chopped into four, put in a box, and being shipped to China. And then me having to suck in the bad air to make it happen.